Police officers of Reddit, is there a call you wish you had never answered? Story 1. I was dispatched on The 65-year-old mother reported her son had just himself. She was refusing to provide CPR or go see if he was okay. I was only a couple blocks away. My best friend and I arrived simultaneously and contacted the complainant at the back door. She was in a thin nightgown and completely calm. She said, he's down there, pointing downstairs. As we made our way down, I noticed a haze in the air, thick enough that it was forming waves in the air. I didn't take immediate conscious notice of it, but both my partner and I commented on a strong smell in the air. Although I knew what it was, I immediately commented that it must be gunpowder, somehow making the connection with the call description of a gunshot. As we got to the bottom of the stairs, I stopped at the sound of horrible moaning coming from a back bedroom. I made eye contact with Adam. You ready? He nodded and we moved in slowly. The bedroom was tucked off a small hallway which intersected with the main downstairs hallway. I saw the blood before entering. Three walls of the room were covered in goo. I still couldn't see the victim, but I could hear him. I saw a rifle laying on the bed, laying in a literal puddle of blood. I forced myself to take a few more steps through the door. Training takes over, and for some reason I was remembering the adage, don't stop in the fatal funnel. As I came through the door, I saw him to my left. He was down on all fours, rocking back and forth. The first detail I noticed was his very red shirt. My mind thought it was weird he was wearing such a very red shirt. I noticed the bottom hem of the shirt was white. It was just a normal white t-shirt. Buddy, we've got help coming. Just stay there. I'm not sure what you're supposed to say. He raised his face to me. It was completely in half, the skin flaps waving back and forth. He had stuck a rifle under his chin, and when he stretched to reach the trigger, his head tipped back. The bullet entered the soft jaw, crossing the hard palate, and left right at the top of his nose. There was nothing left but cheeks. I'll never forget the moaning. I knew it was not funny, but my mind triggered on some sort of zombie and predator fanfic. On all fours, he kept rocking back and forth, shaking his head back and forth and just moaning. The sound is still with me. As he shook his head, the two flaps of cheek kept swinging back and forth, opening and closing, just like the flipping predator. I swear, if that guy had stood up and walked towards me, I would have him. The first few medics arrived. They had been told by dispatch that the subject was Echo, obviously deceased, and hesitated until I pointed out that they needed to get on this one and get on it now. They started to off his red shirt. I told dispatch to get the bird going now. She said, you want them on standby? She was trying to help me, as really only medics are supposed to tell the air medics to fly. No, tell them to fly now, this one's going. My sergeant was the third to arrive. When he got downstairs, he yelled at me, what's that smell? Gunpowder, Sarge. Nah, that's not gunpowder. He breathed a few deep nasal breaths. That's like propane or something. The medic stopped and inhaled. Fudge, we all go silent for the first time. And we all hear at the same time what had been covered up by horrible moaning. In the wall behind where the man himself, there was a bullet hole. Out of the hole was coming a hissing sound. The bullet had through the natural gas main that fed the house from the outside meter. For the first time in my career, I saw firefighters panic. Get out, get out, get out! Three of them yelling at the same time. I got on the radio and called no flames and told everyone to clear. I saw for the first time what the waves of haze I had noticed earlier were. It was natural gas which had filled up the bottom floor of the house, filled it up so much that the top of the gas lake was over my eyes at about six feet deep. The medics grabbed the guy and ran upstairs. I quickly cleared the downstairs thinking the guy might have small in the rooms or something. They were clear. I came upstairs and found Adam sitting calmly in the sitting room with the victim's mother. I stopped, unable to understand what he was doing still in the house. Adam, get them out of here! I wasn't yelling yet, but it made me mad. I had stayed behind for two minutes in a situation that was probably going to terminate me, and he had stayed in the flipping house talking with mom. He looked at me, confused. Adam, get them the fudge out of this house! I was yelling now. The mother stood up, saying she needed shoes. I grabbed her, probably too hard on the arm. She was old. I pushed her through the door. Get the fudge out and do it now. I could feel myself losing a bit of control. I've never, never lost control. Adam didn't understand. He had turned his radio down so he could sit with the mom and not have her hear the terrible details that would likely be on the radio. He didn't hear me give out the evacuate order. He still didn't understand, but he trusted me implicitly. He stepped between me and the mom, who was still trying to get inside. He did what had to be done, but he did it gently at least. I couldn't manage that. I went back in with some hazmat guys ten minutes later. The horror of the room was more noticeable this time. I saw that little bone and teeth chips were stuck in the soles of my boot. I saw that huge glops of human goo were dripping down the walls. I got to the clean wall, the only wall without goo all over it. It was the wall he had faced when he pulled the trigger. I looked down and saw his chin laying on the carpet at my feet. Dispatch, check with the hospital, see if they want this tissue. I couldn't believe I was even asking. The dude was going to pass away. I knew it. Everyone knew it, right? 
That's a firm. They want it delivered. Copy. How the fudge? My sergeant, one of my best friends, offered to do it. Nah, Sarge. Fudge it. I'll get it. I knew I was already going to feel this one. No need for anyone else to have this memory. I grabbed a bio sack from one of the firefighters and went upstairs to the freezer. I put a layer of ice inside and went back to the chin. You know how sometimes it's the false expectations that get you? I went to pick up the chin. For some reason, I knew it would be hard, like chins are. When I grabbed it, though, it felt like unset jello. Of course it did. There was no bone there. It was literally just the chin. It had fallen gooey side down and stuck to the carpet fibers as it dried over the previous 30 or so minutes. I had to tug at it pretty good, and it finally pulled off, landing in my palm, gooey side up. I could see where his whiskers poked out dot 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 fr when the inside. Who ever thought that there was another end to each of our chin whiskers? I gave the bad to a firefighter to run it to the hospital. It didn't matter. I knew he was. Or going to be soon enough. I learned later that he was 45 years old. At age 35, he got a degenerative brain disease, Huntington's or something. It took him pretty quick, leaving him with the reasoning skills of an 8-year-old. His mother begged us on the front grass after I probably bruised her arm just to let him pass away. Where's the DNR? I asked. There wasn't one. He passed away two hours after shooting himself. They pumped blood bag after blood bag into him, but it all just came out his massive facial wounds. The ME called me asked, So that was a weird one, huh? Flipping me's. What you need, man? I asked him. You notice anything strange in there? He asked. Nope, just another flipping. Yeah, figured. All right, see you on the next one, he said. Yup. Story two. Worst for me was an attempt, not because of the victim, who had very superficial cuts to her wrist, found and extraordinarily intoxicated. Her nine-year-old daughter, though, that was the hurt. Sitting in her nightgown, huddled on the floor of the bathroom, her mom's blood all over the floor in her nightgown. Only thing she said was, she made me watch. She said it was my fault. Will she be okay? That one still hurts. Story three. While working as a military police officer in the army, a young kid, I don't remember his age, maybe 11, 12 or so walked into the ER, where I was assigned for the night. He had lacerations to his head, nose was bleeding, an A on his face. He said he was in an accident and needed help. While he was being treated, I went to his house to notify his parents. As soon as I walked in and made contact with his mother, I knew what had happened. Then after looking around the house a bit, I could see lines of blood on a few walls and more on the ceiling. We then notified his father, the service member, who came home and said the blood was from the dog. He said the dog had constant nosebleeds. When we started asking about abuse and the both parents completely denied it. Then we found a can of hairspray with blood on it. This kid had been being beaten with metal cans from all over the house. His parents were swinging the cans at his head so hard it was slicing him open and the blood splatter was ending up on the ceiling. These asshat parents tried blaming it on the dog. Abuse cases were always the worst. Story 4. My dad is a police officer and told me this story once. He responds to a call about a woman standing at the edge of a bridge looking like she's going to jump. Another car radios that they're closer to the bridge, so my dad heads to the underside just in case she jumps. As my dad is getting out of his car, an officer radios that she's tossed a bag or something, and she's gone. My dad gets down to where she landed, and she's passed away from the impact. The bag was actually her three-year-old son. Apparently, she was going to lose custody, and that was how she decided to handle it. He told me it's the closest he's ever come to losing it at work. That even though she had passed away, he wanted to just kick her head in. It probably didn't help that he had four young at home when that happened. Story 5. I worked the other side of the radio. I could have done without the major vehicle accident with fire that we went to a few years back. Driver was on the ground in flames, trying to crawl back into the burning vehicle, screaming for help. His baby girl was deceased in the back seat, still strapped into her car seat. That fire was burning so hot that baby was nothing but bones by the time the fire was extinguished. Driver was flown to the hospital with third-degree burns over a large part of his body and ended up living. It would have been kinder to him if he'd passed away on the way to the hospital. I could have done without hearing a man himself while still on the phone with me. I could have done without walking a hysterical father through CPR on his 18-month-old son, who he claimed he'd found drowned in the tub. In fact, he'd beaten the kid too. I could have done without the call, where the 16-year-old female to the sky herself from a trellis arch with an extension. Her little hands were still clutching the sides of the arch, and the dusty table behind her was covered in scuffs, and streaked footprints where she tried to pull herself back up after jumping and almost, almost made it. It's emotionally draining. Most first responders either get numb, get cynical, or get deeply warped senses of humor. I fall into that third category. It's incredibly difficult to make a career as a first responder if you don't learn to laugh. You have to learn how to take the call and move on. Been doing this for five years and sometimes it feels like forever. Story 6. Daughter of a police officer here. 
My dad has two defining moments in his 30-wire career. Once when a woman took her last breath in his arms after a car accident. Her boyfriend was drunk driving. He was hysterical and my dad basically had to lie to him and tell him everything was okay, even though her head was completely mangled. And once when a father accidentally his 15-year son in the head. My dad was the first arrival for this one. These both happened in the 80s before I was born. But my mom says she'll never forget the look on his face when my dad came home. Edit. The father with the gun was showing the son how to use it or something dot 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 it was in their house. Not sure of all the details, but the gun misfired and the bullet ended up in the back of the boy's skull. The father committed in 2000. Story 7. This story is a little different from the others. Paramedic. One day bought a guy to the hospital who had a single strand from a metal dog hairbrush embedded in his hand. Probably not even worth calling me out. Should have got a cab to the hospital, but hey ho. Basically about an inch long metal splinter. Very, very thin metal stuck in the palm of his hand. There wasn't any it of sticking out. Now everyone knows this is an easy one. Get some medical pliers, make a small incision just to get to the end of the splinter, and literally pull the thing out without snapping it. Bit of antiseptic wipe and a plaster. Five minute job. Only bother with local anesthetic as the patient is a screamer. No problem. Leave the junior doctor with the guy. I had to get back on the road, but I heard the rest from the guys next time I was in. Apparently support staff came back to the room after 20 minutes as the doc wasn't out yet, and it turns out the doc had taken a scalpel and hacked about one inch squared of the guy's hand out uh, to try to get to the splinter enough to pull it out with just his fingers. When the doc's fingers kept slipping on the splint, covered in blood, he just literally hacked out more and more flesh to try and get a better handhold on it. There was blood everywhere, and after about an inch had been hacked out of it, the guy's hand was obviously badly scarred for life over just nothing. A stupid splinter. Okay, not massively horrific. The thing that really gets to me is that they were all strictly told by a senior to not tell the guy or anyone what a complete dog's dinner the whole event had been. And the guy was really thankful to the doc and even sent a thank you card, written like a three-year-old because his hand was so messed up. All the junior doc's colleagues were really supportive of the doc who had a real shrug your shoulders, who cares attitude. For some reason, that just sticks with me as there was no recourse whatsoever to the doc. Story 8. Six years on here. We responded to a traffic crash in which four people were in a sedan. All were intoxicated. The vehicle swerved off the road hitting a culvert and left the occupants injured to the point that they could not exit the vehicle. The driver exited and walked to the roadway to get help. The car caught fire and the passengers still inside were too drunk to know what was happening to get out in time. By the time we arrived on scene, no one was able to get within about 40 yards of the car because of the heat. We were unable to get to the car, despite trying several times. I have seen fatalities before and they are sad. But you learn to deal with it and move along. But these people were screaming for help, and no one could get even close to the car. By the time the fire department showed up, the coroner was pulling up also. It is the worst feeling to see someone go like that, and not WVN be able to try to help. Secondly, we responded to a traffic crash with a pedestrian on the highway. When we arrived, it was clear that this woman had committed, by kneeling down in the road and taking the full brunt of the next car that came down the road. Her husband arrived on scene a few moments after we did. He explained that she had been drinking and they got into a fight. She left the hotel room they were staying in and walked to the highway a couple hundred yards from the hotel. I don't know what his last words to her were, but they were not nice. I will never leave a dispute unresolved with my SO now, and I always make sure I leave her with kind words. Story 9. I was a uniformed member for three years and a detective for another three years before I quit the police. Saw many things that I could have done without, but one in particular was while doing normal response to 10111, our equivalent to 911, as a uniformed member. A friend who worked on my shift happened upon a couple of thieves at a railway line who had managed to stop a passing train and then proceeded to steal cargo from one of the carts, beer to be exact. He started chasing them, and as he caught one, the guy turned around and stabbed him between the shoulder and neck downwards, causing him to bleed out, and he passed away on his way to the hospital. He managed to draw and the suspect as well. What bothered me most about this, apart from the fact that a friend and colleague lost his life, was that we always worked together on the same vehicle. But on this particular day, we were performing special duties and was placed in particular vehicles by the commander. I heard his distress call on the radio, and I was about five minutes away. But by the time I got there, I only found the suspect and was told that he had been rushed to hospital. And another five minutes later, I got the call that he had passed away. As a side note to this, on that very same day, I got the news that I was going to be a dad, and I couldn't wait to see him to tell him the good news. Sadly, I never got the chance. Story 10. Recovering protective social worker here. Candy-addled father shoved a baby wipe down his infant son's throat, 
suffocating the two. I had to listen to the 911 call the hysterical mother made. I had to interview the EMTs who tried, unsuccessfully, to save the 11-year EMT veteran broke down, sobbing in my office. Had to interview the MD who did the autopsy and called it a non-accidental. The guy went to prison. I now do programming and tech support for public safety agencies and have nothing but utmost respect for the dispatchers and men and women who respond to the calls. Story 11. As a cop, we tend to see the worst in people. As a cop in a large metropolitan area, L.A., we tend to see a lot more than the average officer. I'll share some of the stories that haunt us, and I share my own as well as fellow officers in an attempt to maintain my anonymity. I should probably warn you that you don't want to read this, but then you click the link so you should know better, right? I'll tell the stories in first person. The call unit to handle, meet the fire department at address for an attempt. Subject is a female, FD waiting for PD to respond. Code 2. Unit to respond, identify. We get there and ensure the location is safe for FD to enter and give them the green light to help the female out. The attempt wasn't the gruesome part, not even close to some of the worst scenes I've been to. But the story, asking why she did it, and the look on her face when she was revealing her nightmare, is an event I don't care to think about or dwell on. As a teenager growing up, she had an older brother who decided the gang life was for him. And no matter what he did, their parents always had his back. Aside from the violence and the terrorizing of the community, he decided one day he wanted his sister. Her attempts to stop him were futile, and in a state of shock, she told her mother what had happened. As if that wasn't bad enough, her mother told her to shut up and not say anything and told her she must be making stuff up. This wasn't enough for her to ponder. Instead, she went to the police. Her mother disowned her and kicked her out for sending her brother to prison. This wasn't enough for her to ponder. Years later, she has managed to make something of herself and somehow get over the horror show that had been her life so far. She meets an incredible young man who thinks the world of her, and she sees light at the end of this dark tunnel. That is until they find out he has terminal cancer. At this point, she wonders what she's done to anger God so much that she is punished this bad and she says she gives up. I don't have anything on my belt that will make a difference. Handle the call, log it, and clear for the next call. The night's not over. The call not a call, but what we like to call an OBS. OBS short for observation, meaning instead of a radio call generated by someone calling 911. This is an activity generated by the officer's observations. Driving around looking for work and I'm running plates on random cars when one of them returns with a hit. Stolen vehicle. Boom, baby. Control show me following a code 37 vehicle. Northbound ABC Street. Vehicle license. Let me get a backup and airship. We start following. The adrenaline is kicked into high gear. And we wonder if he'll keep driving normal until backup arrives, or if he'll spook and turn this into a pursuit. And there he goes, blowing the red light. Pursuit. Throw the lights and sirens on and we are off. Backup catches up to us and we're following this guy all over the place when it happens. He blows through an intersection and hits a car and there is debris everywhere. A bunch of units go straight to the suspect's vehicle, and as I was about to head over, I see the other car. There's a family inside and a hole through the passenger side of the front windshield. I start heading towards the front of the car, and I see it. I see her. She's been launched several car lengths away, and she's against the curb. Running to her, I see she's in bad shape. As I kneel down next to her, I look down and hear her gasp. And that's it. She takes her last breath. Suddenly, the excitement of the chase isn't so exciting. The call any unit to handle the unknown trouble at address. Code 3 incident. Unit to handle identify. Unknown troubles can quickly turn into cluster fudge. Someone has called 911, but they aren't able to tell the dispatcher enough information, or the call is interrupted and the line goes. So we're going in blind, not knowing what's happened or who's involved. We get there and it's a rather large house. Simultaneously, we see fire department pulling up as well. I yell over to them mentioning, You guys got a call here too, huh? You guys got any info? We don't have cow. Fire tells us all they were told was a medical or panic alarm was activated. As we go up the driveway, a lady comes out of a door and runs to us in tears. And as she's pointing frantically behind her, she gasps, Back there! He's back there! I try to ask her what's going on and who is back in her house. But she's hysterical and runs past us. We start jogging to the back of the residence with our guns drawn expecting, I don't know. Fire is right behind us. And as we get to the back, we see there is a pool and we're looking around. And then we see him. He's in the pool. Fire takes a look and I ask, You guys gonna get him? The response, Fudge that. He's a goner. He's taking a look at him. He looks like he's been in there a while and taking him out wouldn't change anything. Not to mention he's tied himself to weights. Turns out it's A and he'd left a note. We take a look and after reading the note and talking to the man's wife, we learn why he'd terminated himself. The man was a successful professional and had been doing very well for himself and his family. He took great pride in what he did 
and he relied on his sharp intellect to be successful. Unfortunately, a clot formed in his brain, and after going to the hospital to be treated, he was never the same. Tasks took longer and everything became more difficult. He stopped working and stayed home, but having been so independent before it was terminating him to have people helping him, so he decided he'd help his wife out one last time. On her birthday, he freed her from having to take care of him. In his mind, it was a gift he was giving her. She cried and I told her it wasn't her fault. She told me he'd woken her that morning and told her happy birthday. But she was so tired, she told him, Just a few minutes. I'm just so tired. He told her not to worry and to go to bed. That was the last they talked. All right, well, I'm going to go have a beer and try to pretend I didn't relive some of those memories now. Story 12. My dad was a firefighter while I was growing up. There was a call he told me about that stuck with both of us. Down the street from the fire station, there was a community pool, and across the street from that was a house. The yard faced the community pool. The man who lived there sat out in his yard for a while, drinking with a shotgun by his side. When started coming out of the pool to go home, he put the gun in his mouth and pulled the trigger. Story 13. I posted this a while ago, but this is one I wish I'd never come across. I'm a special constable with the UK police. I volunteer but have all the same powers and responsibilities. I started out in a small rural town which is extremely stereotypical of a middle English community, i.e. not somewhere you would ever think bad things would happen. This was one of my first major incidents. I usually do my shift on Friday nights after work, as statistically it is the busiest time for us. It was sometime in early March 2009, and I was paired with a regular officer, and we were out in the response car driving around for the first few hours of the evening until we were scheduled to go to an operation later. Around 11 p.m., a burglary in progress report came over the radio and we said we'd take it, as it was only a few miles from us. Blue lights and siren on, we sped to incident as fast as we could. It was dark and the visibility was pretty nonsense, but we could still see enough to be driving safely. We decided to use a well-known shortcut to get to the other side of a village, avoiding a very annoying bridge-bollard combo that would save a few minutes of our time. The road was next to a farm and was not very well maintained. At the best of times, you could only really do 20 miles per hour down it without causing significant damage to your wheels and underside of your car, but it would still be quicker than the normal road. As we carried on down the track, it quickly became apparent that something wasn't right. There were fresh, muddy tire tracks all over the road and long scrapes in the tarmac as if something metal was being pulled along the floor. At the time, I didn't know why, but it soon became clear when we rounded the corner and saw what looked like the mangled remains of some kind of biomechanical cyborg. Blood, guts, glass, hair, metal. It was all over the road, in the hedges, in the trees. It was absolutely horrific. I had never seen before in such a grotesque form. My partner slammed the brakes on, and we spent a few seconds just absorbing what the hell we were looking at before switching to rescue mode. We raced out of the car, leaving the headlights on to illuminate the scene. Steam was rising from the wreckage, a mixture of radiator coolant and body heat. There was so much blood, it was unreal. Too unreal. Our first priority was to look for survivors. The driver and passenger were obviously, I couldn't see into the back of the car as it was just a complete mess. Over the sound of our engine running, I could hear what sounded like a baby making a very quiet moaning sound. Because our main source of light was from our car headlights, we couldn't see the front of the wreck very well at all. After hearing the noise, I ran back to get the mag light from the boot of the car so we could search the area. Some crash victims have been ejected up to 200 feet from the car. As we came around the front of the car, we realized with horror what had actually happened, why there was so much blood and where the baby was. There was a cow wedged between the car and the ground, completely disemboweled, intestines all over the grass, head snapped backwards, milk was flowing out, feces all over the place. And in the middle of its mother's mangled corpse was a calf, almost ready to be born. It was trapped inside still, and it was very badly injured, but it was alive and mooing to us. Backup arrived not long after, but there was not much that could be done. Soko turned up to cordon the road off and find out exactly what happened. We carried on our shift after that. Story 14. I was secondary on a call for a domestic dispute. Those are never fun to begin with. It was a single wide trailer home in a really bad part of town. We had been to this house many times. They were on our punch card loyalty program. That is a joke. We get there and the woman is beat to hell, so we figured it was no question who was going to jail. So we hook the guy up and call social services for the infant that was sleeping the bedroom because mom was heading to the hospital. Social services shows up to get the kid after a little while. I go to the bedroom to get the baby and notice blisters on his feet. One of the other deputies saw this as well and flipped out. He was a new father and lost his cow. He runs out of the house and grabs the father by the neck and jerks his peach out of the car. The father starts crying and says it was the mother who did it. She admits to it later at the hospital. She says the baby would not stop crying, so she put his feet in boiling water. 
Still to this day, do not know why that would register as a solution to crying. The baby had traces of meth in his system, though. Things involving innocent always got to me. On a positive note, this is in third grade now and is doing great. He was placed with a good foster family and was adopted before he was two. He really has a at a future. His mother is in prison for an unrelated crime, and his father was terminated in what looked like a candy deal gone bad a few years ago. Story 15. Worst call I went to was a simple nine-year-old possible having an asthma attack. I was right on top of the area. The call came out because I had responded as backup on a previous BS call. So I take the call because it would be easy and I didn't have any calls holding in my beat. All I would have to do is show up and wait for FD and the ambulance and let them do their medical thing while I get basic info from the caretaker. I get to the call and it's in Section 8 housing. I am unfamiliar with the area because it's nowhere near my beat or zone. The mother and aunt are screaming. I run upstairs alone and see this nine-year-old seizing. I didn't know what to do other than try to hold him securely so he didn't get hurt. Seizure lasted a minute at most and it was over, but he wasn't breathing. I start CPR for about two minutes when backup arrived and FD because I'm screaming on the radio to step it up. This particular Section 8 housing, I later learned, is a very high violent crime area. When I backed out and let FD take over, there were about 70 people gathered outside this apartment. We had no crowd control, and for whatever reason, people were starting fights. I did my best to manage emotions because no one likes it when A is involved. I followed it to the hospital, but just as I make contact with FD, the ambulance driver lets me know the is gone. Our city does not pronounce Ren at the scene ever. We take them to the hospital working the entire time, no matter what. But now I realize it's my call, and I have to inform the family once we get to the hospital. The family consisted of an entourage of 20-plus people, some of which were causing the fights. I am an emotional guy, so I'm already crying in my patrol car like a little girl just at the thought of how am I going to tell them and the fact this just passed away and I couldn't save him. They are all following the ambulance, thinking the medical team is going to save him, but don't realize he's already gone. We get to the hospital. I've composed myself, and the doctor comes out and informs me, so I need to get the mother. I try to get her alone, but it's a no-go. Entire family insist on being there. I'm struggling to find the words start to get a little teary-eyed, and the mother reads my face and just collapses. I still have to contact Homicide and inform them of the situation due to the circumstances. Family starts fighting with each other over who is at fault over the reason for the asthma attack. It got ugly. Luckily, Hospital PD was there to defuse and no arrests had to be made. I've never heard of a person dying from asthma if they had a breathing treatment, which was the case here. The family did everything right, but he still passed. It has stuck with me, and this is the first time I've told the full story on this. I was trying to be helpful to the zone I was in because they were slammed with calls. I figured I would knock this call out so they could handle the more serious calls. I wish I had never taken this call. Story 16, Dad is a police officer, asked him for his input. He arrived to a call in which a man had a gun to his head and a cell phone to his ear. After a short while on the phone, he pulled the trigger. A few minutes later, my dad picked up the phone to hear a lady screaming and crying, asking what happened. It was his mom. He also told me a story about grandparents that were watching a baby, but the baby fell in their pool and drowned. The parents of thee were yelling and cursing them the whole time, and the grandparents felt horrible. Apparently, they loved the kids so much, and the whole thing was just a super huge accident. The parents still aren't talking to the grandparents, last he'd heard. Story 17. This wasn't me, and it never made me want to be a cop at all. My instructor in security guard accreditation was a former police officer and bodyguard to lots of important people in the Asia-Pacific region, mostly Australia New Zealand. He moved into protecting politicians and rich people after about 15 years as an officer because one event really made him hate the job. He responded to a domestic disturbance in a shady part of town one day and thought it was just some ratbag family throwing punches at each other. They get to the apartment door and nobody answers. There is clearly someone home because there is screaming and someone hitting the wall. He decided it was best not to fudge around and kicked open the door. Scanning the room, he sees a woman crying, screaming, begging her partner to stop what he's doing. And what he is doing is the most despicable thing I couldn't ever imagine. On the other side of the room, her partner is swinging her infant against the wall. It took every ounce of strength in his body to not the illegitimate there and then. And truthfully, I don't think there is a court in Australia that would have said he was wrong. Story 18. Not me, but a friend. He worked as security at a hospital, and one of the patients managed to get on the roof and proceeded to jump. He said the sound of her leg bones shattering and her kneecaps popping out of her legs was the worst thing he has ever heard. He says she was a mangled mess. He quit that job that day due to the trauma. Story 19. Holy cow, where to begin? I've seen a lot of horrible cow in my time, and I've only been a cop for a year. The worst was someone who was to the sky and standing on the outside of a fence on the balcony with one foot on the ground. 
I stood there in the doorway with a negotiator for 10 minutes talking about the girl's life, her family, dreams, favorite movies and shows, trying to get her to calm down. Then out of nowhere in the middle of her sentence, she just jumped. All I think of now is how I could have grabbed her. I could have just saved her if I was a little faster. It was my fault that the mother had to deal with the loss of her only. Story 20. Not a cop, but a paramedic. Sister's boyfriend is a student paramedic, only for a year or two, and with his partner was called to a woman who'd taken meth or some kind of other hard candy or mixture of them. She thought there was broken glass behind her eyes and ended up tearing them out because of the pain. Story 21. I'm not a police officer, but a local police officer in my town has a pretty messed up up story. She doesn't do much police work now so much as public speaking for the police. She was called to a house where a woman had been babysitting while the parents were out to dinner. I'm not sure who made the call, but I'm pretty sure it was the babysitter. Anyways, when they showed up, the babysitter was on the front lawn completely covered in blood and hysterical, but not like upset hysterical, just nuts. The officer and her partner got out and tried to talk to her, and she wasn't making any sense, just kind of saying, no, she'll be fine. They can just sew it back on. That was a little more unnerving by the fact that she had bloody scissors in her gown. They didn't know this until later. The officer's partner stayed with the hysterical woman and tried to get her to make sense while the officer who now does public speaking went in to check out the house. She found the daughter who was being babysat completely decapitated by a pair of flipping scissors. She went out to get her partner and say what she found. And when the woman who did it realized what was probably going to happen, she freaked out and pulled the scissors on the officer that found the daughter. She ended up stabbing her in the hand. Not as bad as it could have been, right? Turns out the lady with the scissors had HIV and the blood was both her own and the daughter's. The officer had to go on an HIV medication to prevent infection and ended up becoming very sick for about a year. Afterwards, she was in the clear from infection and returned to work. Story 22. Not a police officer, but I have a story involving first responders that I could have gone without experiencing. When I was in middle school, I had a friend. Let's call her H. She had a rough life so far abusive dad, grew up in poverty, only real father figure was deployed in Iraq, sister was getting into sweets, the whole nine yards, and she was only 13, 14. Despite all that, she was pretty pleasant, and she was an amazing friend. Normally, I would walk her home from school, and then my mom would pick me up from her house. One day in class was particularly rough for H. We were in the same history class, and were working on our family tree projects. Some made a sideways comment about how H couldn't use her stepfather's info because he isn't her real dad. She retorted, he raised me, therefore he's more of a dad than my real one. His next comment makes my blood boil to this day. Well, whatever. You're not worthy of a real dad anyways. She was normally the type to let things go, but she got very upset about it. She cried for a bit and moped around the rest of the day. The next day, I saw her in first period, but she wasn't in eighth period. One of my friends said that she was in the class before, but went home sick. At the end of eighth period, I had a weird feeling about it, so I ran to her house after school. The front door was wide open. I yelled into the house, no response. I went up to he's room, not there. Went down to the basement, and there she was, covered in blood. My body kicked into autopilot. I ran over to her. She had used her stepfather's hunting knife to carve up her arm and was barely conscious. I took off my jacket and tied it tightly around her wound. I called 911, and they were there within minutes. The next 24 hours were a blur. H survived the attempt. I was talked to by a million police officers and doctors. The paramedics were amazing. Told me I did a fantastic job considering I had no training whatsoever. My parents had difficulty bringing it up. One EMT said that it was one of the hardest calls he's gotten. H had trouble readjusting once word got around about her attempt. She transferred schools and we don't talk anymore. Apparently she's married now. I need a beer. Story 23. My dad was an EMT before I was born. Got a call one day in the middle of winter, arrived to a bad car crash. Turns out the driver was completely wasted and had his not even two wire old daughter sitting in the back with no seatbelt and wearing nothing but a diaper. He got there to see the firefighter doing CPR on the... He took over the CPR after a few minutes. Before starting, he ran his hand down the back of this head to check for exterior damage to the body, only to find the back of the head was busted open. The firefighter didn't realize he was doing CPR on a... My dad said it was the worst thing he'd ever experienced. That was his last call and he quit the next week. Story 24. My best mate's sister is an EMT. Her first call was a woman had smashed the back window of her Aston Martin, tied a rope from a tree through the window around her neck. Then she gunned it in a straight line until the rope went taut and decapitated her. Pretty awful first call, really. Story 25. I've told this story on Reddit before, but this is the worst call I've ever been on. I was with my field training officer on what I think was my second week in training when we got a call for a... It's the middle of August in the south and we arrive and park in front of the house. We step outside and immediately smell.
this guy to the sky himself in a barn and decided to tell no one about his plan to terminate himself. So he's been marinating on the August heat for two weeks before someone smelled him. We walk inside and my partner points out that two rats are eating chunks out of his eyes and tells me to get up there and shoo them away. I find a ladder nearby and grab a stick when I lose my balance and grab the nearest thing. It's his rotting body and apparently the weight of both of us could not be supported by the beam. So I land on my back and his entire bloated body lands on top of me and bursts open from his stomach. I had his smell on me for what seemed like months. And ever since then, I won't deal with that cow anymore. Story 26. My coworker's story. He ended up using this event to help people. My friend was a scuba diver and very good at it. He was diving at a lake one day when the cops came and told him and his buddy they needed to leave ASAP. It turns out a small boy had drowned an hour earlier and they needed to trawl the lake for the body. This was in the 70s, so the way you found a drowned body was to tow a huge metal rake behind a motorboat until it hit something. My friend's offer to help the police officers was refused because it was against their rules. So he and his buddy watched the police trawl the lake for over six hours while the sobbing mother watched from the shore. Eventually, they did make a hit, and when they got the trawl out of the water, the boy's body was attached. He was mangled beyond recognition with a spike through his head and torso and broken limbs pointing the wrong directions because that's what trawls do to human bodies. When the mother saw this, she dot 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 br okay. Not only had she lost her son, but to see him mangled way. So my friend turns to his buddy and says, this will never happen again. The next day, he contacts his diving club and asks for volunteers. Then he goes to the police department and offers his group services to them for free for any water searches they get. Soon they were doing all the body retrievals for the police and fire department. They were able to find the bodies much faster and return them intact. They did this for over 15 years until the department got their own scuba search and rescue team. Story 27. I was married to a cop. Hearing his stories and living his nightmare was a constant. The guy who was riding a motorcycle and got hit by a car, which him in half, with his intestines and organs spread between the two halves of his body. The man who disappeared and was found a week later stuck in a culvert. His flesh was coming off his body. He was bloated and the smell was horrid. That was his first call. The young man who was base, jumping from the bridge, 486 feet above the water, and his chute did not open, so he did a free fall. The video his friends took showed how he curled into a fetal position just before he hit the water. It blew his shoes off when he hit. His internal organs were mush. The same bridge that following Thanksgiving, a couple drove almost 200 miles while arguing. They got to the bridge and out of the car, still fighting. The man jumped to his. The woman quickly followed. After recovery of the bodies, the coroner found that the woman was actually a man with his parts duct taped between his cheeks. And then my worst nightmare, getting a call that they were taking my husband to the hospital after he was hit outside his patrol car while on a call. Story 28. I haven't had much bad cow happen. Skewicides are tragic, but accidents are what get you thinking. You see signs of struggle, that last attempt to survive. You look at your own life, your wren, and you think, how can I protect them? How can I protect myself? I can't. The things I've seen is nothing I want to share. Story 29. My mom was an officer and told me a story about where she arrived on the scene of a terrible crash. A man crashed his Crown Victoria into the back of an 18-wheeler drunk driving on night. When my mom got to the driver's side, she realized it was actually one of her good friends from high school. The guy seemed perfectly fine except for a superficial head wound. They ended up chatting until firemen came over and were able to remove him from the wreckage. The entire time my mom was holding a conversation, the other officer seemed uncharacteristically grim and just said, look at the steering wheel over and over again a few times. The steering wheel was pushed forward, but the airbag didn't even deploy. After the ambulance showed up and brought him to the hospital, my mom decided to pay him a visit at the end of her shift a few hours later. When she arrived, she found one of the EMTs that transported him out in the lot and asked him about her friend. The EMT told her he bled out immediately and passed away on the trip to the hospital. It turned out that the impact of the crash threw him forward so hard that his chest took the whole impact and crushed that steering wheel forward. The entire time my mom was talking to him, he was basically already from bleeding out internally. This was the third time this has happened to the other officer on the scene who was grimly repeating, look at the steering wheel. Story 30. Police dispatcher here. I think this is going to be buried at this point, but it'll be nice to get off my chest anyways. I've had a couple of calls that have shaken me up. My first to the sky caller was the first call that ever really shook me up. He called 911 and was wanting to know if taking a large amount of Seroquel would terminate him. He wouldn't give me any information like address, name, or anything like that so that I could get him help. I had just got out on my own, and I think the panic of trying to deal with that on 911 was part of the reason that was so memorable. 
Another was a burglary in progress where a female and could hear the person banging around downstairs. I work for a small municipality in the OKC metro area, and the call was just inside of Oklahoma City, so I transferred her to OKC and continued listening in on the call. I was very impressed with how well she was staying calm with the situation. Then she remembered that her daughter was in the other room and completely lost her composure. Another call that was just barely outside of my city came to me initially the other night, and the lady said that her husband had been in the garage and the person came into her house. The shooter ended up fleeing from the house inside of Oklahoma City, got in a pursuit with a unit from another small local municipality, and ended up crashing in mine. One I lost sleep over was a girl that came home to find her fiancé and to the sky himself with an extension cord successfully. She was absolutely hysterical. I hate these sorts of call not because of their high priority, but rather because all you can do is tell people that help is on the way. It feels like such an empty gesture to tell people that think they may have lost a loved one or are about to be terminated themselves that you have people on their way and do your best to keep them calm and give you information. Every first responder has a deep-seated urge to help people in their most desperate moments and it's the hardest on call takers sometimes when we have to subdue that. There is nothing worse than knowing that you may be on the phone with somebody in their last few moments as they plea for you to send help. Story 31. I have a friend who's a paramedic who has told me about his worst night several times. He ran a call on a car accident. When they got there, the car had already burst into flames and for the most part, burned out. It was a family of four, and he found two little charred bodies in the back seat. He had to take leave for a week after it. And this is someone who has found teenagers' severed heads lying in the road and gone to Taco Bell afterwards. 